Okay. Oops. Grab the right thinking notes here, Mr. White. I did it. I did that already. Do you have an extra for me? Uh, I think so. I, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna put it in later so that all classes, because that way they don't get taken. Great. Okay, so we're coming back to England here. All right, and we know that England kind of has like it's got some at that time. It's got some religious issues. It's it's okay. You had Henry the Eighth. He had been technically Catholic. Then he goes and wants to form his own church so he can make sure he gets a, an annulment with Catherine of Aragon. Yada, 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 big stuff. Forms his own church, the Church of England, the Anglican Church. All right, that church kind of does its thing. The thing is, is that what's going to cause this is to many people who became Protestants, the, uh, the Anglican Church does a lot of, has basically, it's like the Catholic Church. They kept all the practices all the the rituals and the and the all the different prayers even and they decided well we're just it, it was just they just took it and and transferred all that and then just called it something new so a lot of there are a lot of people in england that, that felt like that catholicism was not the true way to worship and so they didn't like this whole anglican thing all right but you also have catholic queens and kings coming back and they rule and they try to they think that anglicanism is is not catholic enough because they got it wrong Whole big stuff, and that's what the English Civil War is going to be about. It's it really is in some ways, in some ways, a religious war. Okay, so here's our main idea: in the 1600s, England underwent a civil war and a revolution, overthrew the king, established an elected Commonwealth, which was another kind of type of government they had, and then they got a king back again. That that Commonwealth was religiously based. Okay, um, we when we think about American history and we talk about the Puritans. The Puritans, you know, settled in the, the colonies and they, you know, they, they, they were people think of them as very sort of stodgy people. Uh, the Puritans didn't call themselves Puritans because they thought they were pure. They called themselves Puritans because their goal was to try to purify the English church. They thought that, like I said, the English church had too many sort of Catholic styled things. They thought those were incorrect. And so they wanted to purify the, the Catholic Church. The Puritans that came to the New World often had plans to go back at some point, basically. Not they themselves, but the idea was they would start their own church over here, establish it, and then send it back to England and purify the English Church. Okay, so let's kind of try to understand what's going on here. All right, we go way back to Elizabeth. She doesn't have any children. So the, the house of the Tudors dies off, and it passes on to the, a family known as the Stuarts. And they were, they were Scots. James I was the first one that, that really takes the throne. Okay, so you got the king. All right, this is kind of how – and this, I find this interesting because I'm doing a lot of stuff lately with having my classes start to make more decisions about how, how the class goes. Um, I'm going to integrate that with you guys in a couple weeks or so. But what's going on here is the king basically, he's got almost absolute power for the most part. But working sort of for the king was something called parliament. And parliament is just a place where uh, representatives from around the country – make sure you're sitting up, everybody, so you get proper airflow. Jake, there you go. Uh, so they come from around the country, and they advise the king on how to run the country. But they see their job as more to actually help the king decide, whereas the king sees their job as just to give him advice. Okay, so James was a very powerful monarch. He's a, he definitely a Hobbes guy, definitely a fear me instead of love me. And this led to a lot of problems with parliament. He was a divine right guy. He was a guy that believed that he was backed by God. God made him king. God gave him the power. He spent lavishly on his lifestyle, ran up England's expenses. He doesn't spend quite as much as Louis XIV does with Versailles and all that crazy stuff, but he spends a lot. He also ended a war with Spain on terms or an agreement that really was not beneficial to England, and many this made him very unpopular. 
They were fighting Spain. He ends the war against Spain. They signed a treaty, but England's got to pay a lot of money to Spain, and people did not like this. Okay. He, okay, so we talked about the Puritans. They were Christians who disagreed with the Anglican Church. They wanted to purify it of its Catholic traditions and rituals. So James, he was an Anglican. He threatened the Puritans. Now, remember, when we talk about people getting religious freedom in this time, this is not the thing like, oh, you get to decide what you believe, you know, you know you're into New Age stuff, whatever. No. No, the religious freedom is the freedom of the king to choose his religion, not anybody else for the most part. Some did that, but James was not into that. When these Puritans, because, because the Anglican Church was tied into the government, because James was backed by, you know, God, basically, and then these people, these Puritans are saying, no, 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 James, you've got it all wrong. You're worshiping incorrectly. Uh, James is going to say, well, I have to get rid of these people because if my power comes from God— and these guys can run around saying, oh, no, 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 he's got the wrong God, or he's worshiping God incorrectly. They might be able to overthrow me. So those Puritans, they, they got persecuted and threatened. They left. They went to North America. He commissions a group of scholars to write a new translation of the Bible, known as the King James Version. And if you've read any Bible that has these and thous and thys, uh, that's probably either derived from the King James Version or is the King James Version. Okay, after James, you get Charles I. He behaved very badly. He was a divine right guy. He's still an Anglican, but he married a Catholic woman. And this, was, this makes everybody angry. This makes the Puritans angry because they say, Catholic? No. This makes the Anglicans angry. Maybe he made the Catholics happy, I guess. Maybe they were mad she married a, an Anglican, but whatever. We don't know. Then he dissolves Parliament. So this group of people that is there to advise the king... He wants to fight a war. They won't pay for it. He relies on them to pay for it because the king can't just go out and tax people. He needs the people in parliament to go out and do it for him, basically. But they won't vote for it. They don't want to do it. And he gets mad, so he gets rid of them. He says, go away. He, what he did was in order to get the money to fight this war, he forced farmers to supply loans to him or he threw them in jail. So he basically told people, give me some money or you're going to jail. And, you know. And people did not like that. Uh, he began to quarter troops in people's homes, which means that he took troops from his, his army and, and stationed them in people's homes. And um, he also declared martial law in towns, which means that normal law, civil law, doesn't take effect. It's military courts and military rule. So people's rights are taken away in a lot of cases. He behaves really badly. Okay, so Charles gets desperate for money. He gets as much money out of the farmers as he can. And uh, he says, I got to get Parliament. I need some money. All right. So he calls Parliament up. He says, hey, everybody, come on back. I need you to find a way. We got we to raise, collect some taxes. Parliament says, listen, you dissolved us before. So if, we're, if you want us to help you collect taxes, you're going you're gonna to sign an agreement that outlines your rights and our rights. It was called the Petition of Rights. So basically it said Charles would agree he couldn't collect taxes or force loans on people. He couldn't imprison people without cause. He couldn't quarter troops in people's houses. And he couldn't declare martial law. So they say, okay, here's what you're going to agree to. He says, nope, forget it. Well, I'm sorry. No, let me backtrack. He signs it. Then he just simply starts to ignore it. And he dissolves parliament again and sends him home once he has what he wants. Okay. Parliament at this time is now going to start to get their power back here. Then he's got a war against the Scots. They're invading from the north. They're, you know, it's not quite Braveheart, but it's the same kind of thing going on there. They're fighting a war. He needs, you need money to fight a war. He calls Parliament again. Parliament is like, all right, we're, listen, for this to work, we have to be able to work together. They voice their complaints. He dissolves them again. He brings them back again. He's just kind of back and forth. And at this time, this parliament's going to say, look, this is the last time this is going to happen. We're going to decrease your power. You don't get to just send us home. We're going to be a body that's always here. Okay. They make 19 propositions. He basically has to agree to them. And you start to get, like, different groups forming. One of them supports Charles. One of them opposes Charles. And they send 19 propositions to Charles. They send these ideas of how Parliament's power is going to be stronger and the king will be weaker. 
When they send him the 19 propositions, Charles simply has them arrested. He says, I'm not going to deal with these. I'm the king. Can't rob the door. Uh, and he arrests the leaders. So this is going to, this is what results in the war. So a war starts between those who uh, support Charles and those who oppose him. The supporters for Charles were called Cavaliers, and the ones that supported Parliament were known as Roundheads. This is Oliver Cromwell. He led the Roundheads. He, they basically win, 1646. Long story short, uh, so they're Puritans. They want to get rid of the Anglican Church, and uh, they put Charles on trial, and they execute him. This is kind of shocking to people because this is like – um, it was one thing for a king to take over another king and, and you know, maybe kill him. But it was another thing for people to rise up, overthrow their king, and, and then kill that king. That was kind of scary. So the new government was an elected commonwealth. But it was not like a nice government where everybody gets a vote. and You know, they had to crush opposition, as most governments that take over do. There were royalist people in Ireland. Uh, Ireland's part of, of the English uh, the United Kingdom then, basically, sort of. Uh, they they opposed this. There were levelers. Levelers, you know, this voting thing isn't for everybody. But the levelers believe that every man should get a vote. We don't know how many levelers believe that women should get the vote, too, but, but that would have been completely revolutionary. Anyway, what does Cromwell do? He dismisses Parliament, too. He finds this whole, like, taking suggestions thing to be kind of troublesome. He dismisses them, and he sets up Puritan military rule. Then he dies. His son takes over, and he's just bad at his job, and they get overthrown. So what happens? They bring the king back. Now, this time, when Parliament brings the king back, the king knows that he's not going to have the same power the king's had before. So Charles II, he was actually a pretty good king. They called him the Merry Monarch. He was marrying a lot of ways. I mean, the guy the guy was a party animal. He really was. I don't know what slang we would use to, to describe. Uh, lit. Lit might be the word we would use to describe his coronation. Um, yeah. So, big party when he gets made king again. Uh, a philanderer or two. A real womanizer. They, they really... He was so all over the place with that kind of thing that it was it was a little bit tricky deciding who was the father. It was just it was just messy. Anyway, and but he settles with Parliament. He basically they, they're able to work it out. So the Church of England becomes the official Church of England at this time, and they get rid of all the Puritans. They send them away. Okay, after Charles II, England becomes what we call a constitutional monarchy. So what is a constitutional monarchy? You have a monarch, king, queen, whatever, but their power is limited by something called a constitution. And the constitution is what makes up the government. Now, the United States was new. England had a constitution, but it's really – okay, so the American constitution is a document that you can read and see what it says and go, okay, it says this. The English constitution is a lot more vague. It's not an actual document. It's a collection of different things that make up how the English government works together. Um, imagine like if you had to compare like cars, imagine that the American government is kind of like is if you simply built a car custom from the ground up, you would you would do what you, you just come up with the, you know, the best thing you could think of. Their constitutional monarchy is kind of like a car that's been, you know, just rehabilitated every five years. You just kind of add something new to it. It's a little more patchwork. But they all agreed you had to limit the power of the king. Okay, but guess what? Charles dies, his brother takes over. James, this is James II. He tries to reestablish all the all this stuff, back eight slides here, all this stuff that you don't want to go back to. That's the stuff he tried to put back in place. All right, so what happens then? You're not going to get as much blood and guts. He wants absolute power. He claims divine right. He thinks he has the right to suspend or ignore laws whenever he wants. He says, I'm the king. I can do whatever I want, regardless of what Parliament says. But Parliament has so much power now that they basically oppose him. He flees out of the country, and this was known as the Glorious Revolution because there was no fighting, basically. He just gets out of town.
Okay, so what do you do? Okay. He's gone. Charles the First. This guy, you know, this guy was he did, he was not a faithful guy, so he didn't produce any legitimate children. James, you can't get any of his kids to do it. Where are we gonna find a king? Now it seems crazy, but back then they just go to another country. So they go to a place called Orange, which is in the Dutch Netherlands, and they find William and Mary. So were they Dutch? Yeah, they were Dutch. Is that weird? Not not back then. It's not. It's not that strange that somebody from a different country would be your king. Very strange now, but not strange then. And uh, they came in, and they were great. Everybody loved them pretty much. And they swore that they would basically observe the rules of parliament. And so this is one more step in the process of making the kings and queens of England less and less powerful. To today, where they basically serve no function within the government, they simply uh, are the person that England puts forward as the um, representative, yeah, of the country. And, um, you know. As being legitimate. I mean, they knew. Yeah. They probably knew they were, he were, they were his, but they were with women that were not the queen, basically. So that's problematic so oh uh, yeah so yeah well, they were great uh, is there anything i need to mention on that oh yeah so they restrict the power of the king pretty pretty heavily the king can't raise taxes king can't have an army without permission of parliament they can't suspend laws parliament also has freedom of debate so they can they can just speak about well, pretty much whatever they want and they're going to start making laws they're also going to say that individual rights should be guaranteed so the right to have a jury trial, the right to not just be – Sebastian, you okay? Make sure you're taking notes. Oh, okay. All right. That's no good. Um, so parliament uh, – oh, sorry. Yeah. So a great example, the right to a jury trial. Uh, someone cannot just simply throw you in jail and leave you there to rot. Uh, freedom from cruel and unusual punishments. Did we talk about hanging, drawing, and quartering in here? Yeah, that kind of thing. That, that should be ended. Parliament also previously had passed a law preserving the right of habeas corpus, that no one can be held without being accused of a crime. Meaning that if you're accused of doing something, they have to accuse you to hold you, and, and to hold you, they have to charge you with something. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So when we finally get to the American Revolution tomorrow, when the American colonists are talking about the rights that they believe we have, they had – don't get the impression that the United States like invented these ideas. The only thing the United States really invents, and but this is important, is the idea that the people can govern themselves, that they can they don't need kings or queens or things like that. They can form their own government in order to protect their rights and freedoms. Go America. Okay. How many questions are there? Four? Let's review for five minutes.